We have been talking about geometrical characterization with more emphasis on chemical characterization and uh, this is where we were discussing about the contaminant transport in porous media and the prelude to studying the porous media contaminant transport was that uh, if I want to find out desorption, desorption characteristics, it is better to understand the transport mechanisms first and this in short will tell you how the interaction between porous media and contaminants are taking place and then quantify this by using a term which is KD that is the distribution coefficient. I think I explained this in the last lecture also. The first dimension or the one first uh, one dimensional advection diffusion equation. And having finished this, then we will move on to thermal characterization and electrical characterization. So, let me now introduce you to the sorption characteristics. This is pending since long. And uh, I think I had said that we will be discussing about sorption in details. So, today's lecture is going to be slightly intricate in terms of the environmental geomechanics concepts related to uh, the way contaminants interact with porous media or the geomaterials. So, sorption is a mechanism which is uh, quite new for you I understand, but uh, there are so many applications that most of you must be aware of where all this is happening. So, there are two components associated with the sorption process. The first one is adsorption and second one is absorption. Absorption I think you all of you understand what is absorption all right. So, suppose there is a spillage of water and you take a cloth or you take a sponge just keep it over there and the due course of time the entity thing everything gets absorbed. The best logic is the sabullas all right. So, and so the moment you take it out depending upon how much pressure you are applying some juice will come out clear. So, the same philosophy is valid in case of absorption. So, what is happening at micro level if you consist if you think that the porous media consists of pores and skeleton of minerals. So, the pores are the places where most of the fluids will remain or they will get logged or they will get uh, you know what we call it as a part. This is fine. So, this is the process of absorption mostly physical phenomena the fluid entering into the pore spaces because of physical mechanisms capillarity is a sort of a absorption. So, I am sure you must have I do not know how many of you have cleaned any floor or surface in your homes. So, when you want to clean something I am sure the tendency is to apply a little bit of pressure on the mop. Try doing this tomorrow morning on your study table. So, you normally do not just mop without applying some pressure. The whole idea is you apply some pressure what is happening in the process. You are squeezing out air from the cloth or from the duster or from the foam clear and when you are applying little bit of pressure this air gets displaced and suction gets created and that suction is responsible for lifting the dust particles. This is fine, it is a simple physics. You must have noticed maid servants or sometimes you know whosoever mops the house, what would you do? You soak the cloth in water and then squeeze it. So, when you are squeezing the whole cloth which is wet, you are displacing the water out of the pores clear. So, suction gets generated. Long time back I had talked about swell water characteristic curve SWCC and there I had emphasized upon the fact that water comes out, but air does not go inside and that is the bubbling point or air entry value. You remember this portion of the curve where the transition is taking place air entry value. So, the moment pressure exceeds this pressure air enters into the pores clear. 
So, all these logics are basically guiding us in understanding what is the absorption process. So, you displace one fluid, the second fluid may fill up the pores capillarity. The dust may also get stuck to the surface because of absorption. Now, at micro level what is happening? These are different phases of the material, solids interacting with fluids, fluids interacting with solids, within the fluids also is the liquids and gases interacting with the solids, clear. So, long back we had studied if you remember three phase systems, two phase system, single phase system, fine. So, these are the good examples of how to apply those concepts in real life problems. Now, on the contrary, the second component of sorption is adsorption, attachment on the surface, all right. Superficial phenomena, superficial in the sense it happens on the surface, you may say surfacial, surfacial phenomena which happens only on the surface. But if the chemical activity of the contaminants is extremely high, having come in contact with the surface, the tendency of the contaminant would be to percolate into it, concentration gradient, is a membrane getting formed, you remember? So, one side the concentration is very high, inside the grains the concentration of contaminants is less. So, again there is a membrane effect higher concentration to low concentration the contaminant will penetrate through. Now, this is guided by the chemistry of the material or the mineralogy of the material. So, we normally call it as a chemisorption. There could be biosorption also where the bioelements are getting sorbed onto the surface of a system, fine. So, broadly these are the two things which constitute sorption process. So, A plus B is equal to sorption, clear. So, suppose if I soak a rock sample in uncontaminated water, pure water, all right. And the way you have found out the porosity of the rocks and soils. So, what you normally do is you dip the sample in the water and you assume that all the pores have got filled up with water and you take the wet weight minus the dry weight, divide by the dry weight and there is a percentage of the porosity, clear. So, this is one process which is absorption, but suppose if the water in which I am going to soak the material happens to be contaminated, clear. So, then what is going to happen? It is not only the physics which is going to govern, it is the chemical concentration which is also going to participate in the process and becomes adsorption process, clear. So, put together the two, it is the sorption. So, by dictionary meaning absorption is incorporation, assimilation or inclusion of something into a matrix, clear. So, matrix is nothing but consist, cons, constituting of pores and particles. However, adsorption is accumulation of a substance on the surface only, that is the main difference. Is this clear? So, for sorption you have to have a surface. Now, it is another thing if you look at the absorption process, whatever fluid has gone into the pore space, the pores are also having one surface with the grains. Are you getting this point? So, once the contaminant enters the pores of the porous media, the first phenomena is absorption and later on sorption may start absorption, sorry adsorption may start, clear. So, put together these two will constitute of the sorption, is this part clear? Now, this is what happens in most of the situations which we are going to talk about. So, in absorption atoms or molecules move into the bulk of a porous media, capillary spaces that is the absorption of water by a sponge and this is how I can depict it. You know, there is a surface activated charcoal because of its capacity, the particles are getting attracted towards it. So, the first thing is the surface getting created between a material and any type of contaminant. This could be in the gaseous phase, this could be into the in the liquid phase. 
So, the definition of the adsorption would be atoms or molecules move from the bulk phase that is solid, liquid or gas onto a solid or liquid surface, fine. So, when I say air in contact with liquids, <coughs> so there is a contact surface and air might get sorbed into the liquid phase. Liquid in contact with the solids, there is a contact surface and liquid getting sorbed onto the solids provided it is contaminated. Gases can also get sorbed onto the solids, sequestration under higher pressures or because of very high affinity of the surface. Is this part okay? So, most of the situation where you are talking about creation of filters, purification of something, I think I have cited so many examples of zeolites, molecular sieves where you can pass effluent through it and it gets clean, alright. So, if chemical activity is present, the process is going to be adsorption. So, this is what I have written here, purification by adsorption wherein impurities are filtered from liquids or gases by their adsorption onto the surface, filter surface of a high surface area solid such as activated charcoal. Is this part clear? And then some of the applications would be formation of a thin layer. So, the moment a thin layer get formed, the mechanics of adsorption starts. These are the basics about it. Any questions or is this clear? So, there are few terms which normally are used when we talk about the sorption process. The first one is adsorbate. I hope you understand what is adsorbate. The one which is getting sorbed. So, molecules that have been adsorbed onto solid surfaces, any sort of contaminant is adsorbate. Adsorbent, so adsorbent would be a sorbent, sorb sorbate, sorbate. So, if a fluid is there, water carrying some contamination. So, this is what is known as adsorbate or we call them as substrate. So, most of the time the particles of the sands, clays are going to be substrates, surface. Is this part okay? So, in case of adsorbed cations tightly held on surfaces of negatively charged dry clay particles, I think I have cited a lot of examples that why these bentonites are used for cleansing of skins. You know, I have cited so many examples where you use them as a uh, re skin rejuvenators. Why? Because the moment you apply them on the skin, on this surface of the particles of bentonite, most of the contaminants, sweat, bacteria, different type of salts, they get sobbed and hence the skin becomes rejuvenated, clear. Then the second thing is that uh, this is the pictorial diagram which is normally used to define the sorption process. So, you have clay particles and clay particles are substrates on which the cations of a contaminant are getting parked. So, most of the cations because they are positively charged they have a natural affinity towards clay particles because they are negatively charged, clear. So, what it proves is for enhancing the sorption process, either you enhance the surface charge, how would you do that? Suppose if I want to make a particle charged, what are the methods? Put a electric field across it, that is a temporary phase. If I want to make a particle permanently negatively charged, crush it. So, the finest particle would have a fundamental charge on its surface which is negatively charged particle, clear. So, that is why the more and more you crush the particle, you remember we are talking about physical activation of particles. So, the more you crush them, finer they become, higher the surface area higher the sorption capacity, higher the capacity to attract the cations towards them and hence they become excellent sorbents. This is part clear. So, truly speaking this is a surface mechanism which is being talked about. 
So, this mechanism is becoming very useful in understanding the contaminant transport through porous systems. I hope now you can realize why. So, if your porous media happens to be hyperactive because of the type of minerals which are present in it and if they are clay minerals which are very highly active in terms of their mineralogy, it is understood that they will be having negative charged, negatively charged and hence they will attract most of the cations which are passing through it. So, they are acting like a sort of a trap that no cation can pass through it and everything will get locked on the surface, the best possible filters which you are going to design. And these filters are going to remove most of the ionic species present in the solutions or the gases. And hence these materials are going to be the best possible cleaning agents for environmental protection. So, either you select a species which is of clay mineral type, very fine grains, extremely high surface area, very high cation exchange capacity, negatively charged surfaces and use them as a catalyst filters or if they are not present in the system, you activate them or physically fractionize them in such a manner that they become very fine particles. I hope this part is clear. The reverse process is the desorption process. So, here we were talking about the attachment on the surface. Now, somehow if I can break the bond between the cation which is sitting on the substrate which happens to be a clay particle by applying any type of energy. A simple energy would be break the hydrogen bond. So, pour more fresh water, clear. So, dilution of the solution occurs and because of dilution of the solution, the hydrogen bonds are becoming weak and hence cation will have a tendency to come out in the solution phase leaving the substrate. What could be the second mechanism? I can apply electric field across the material. So, what is going to happen? If your clay particles are all having cations into them, contaminated soil, I will apply potential in such a manner that all these cations will have a tendency to migrate towards the cathode. Clear? Electroosmosis. So, you must have come across several papers where contaminated soils can be remediated by applying certain amount of voltage, we call them as electrokinetics, electroosmosis, electrophoresis and so many other forms of you know electronic movement can be controlled to decontaminate the soils. So, those of you who might get a chance to work in decontamination of soils of any type will have to follow one of these schemes. So, the best possible examples of these options are uh, cleaning up projects, remediation of contaminated lands and so many lands are contaminated, clear. So, the reverse of these option phenomena is desorption and the way I want to regulate it, I can regulate it either by increasing the concentration soil washing, I can apply vacuum. I can heat it. So, the moment you heat the soil mark, what is going to happen? The bond between the foreign elements or the contaminants and the soil particles is going to get broken, fine and soils become decontaminated. So, heating would be the best option for soils which are heavily contaminated with hydrocarbons. So, the moment you elevate the temperature, what is going to happen? The bond between this substrate that is a clay particle and the hydrocarbon is going to weaken. Rheology also changes. So, the moment you heat the soils which are having hydrocarbons in them, what is going to happen? The rheology of hydrocarbons is going to change. Densities are going to change, viscosities are going to change. The bond which is getting formed between the particle and the hydrocarbon molecules is also going to get changed. Are you realizing the mechanics associated with cleanup project? 
Now it is up to you how you are going to administer a strategy to clean up the project, clean up the sites, clear? The same thing I can do with the help of air purging also. I hope you are realizing these points, clear? So what, what is air purging? When you drink cold drinks, what do you do sometimes? You purge the air in the cold drink, is it not? And then a lot of bubbling takes place, normal phenomena, very bit dull. So what you are do, trying to do by this? Again you are purging in air, that means you are forcing air to go inside the soils and this air under high pressure is either oxidizing something in the system or is trying to break the bond between the contaminants and the substrates because of high pressures. And if it is a moist air, what I am going to do? I can again detach these contaminants in the moist phase of the air which may take out some of these cations which are sorbed onto the substrates. So this is another mechanism of decontamination. So how many mechanisms we have talked about? Soil washing, electrokinetics, then heating, then we have talked about air purging and what else we talked about? I think mostly 5, 6, clear? So these are the mechanisms which can be designed for cleaning up of the contaminated sites. This is fine. So this option is a phenomena where I would like to see how easily this bonding between the cations and the substrates can be broken for achieving certain objectives. So I think I have discussed about all these things. It occurs in a system being in a state of sorption equilibrium between bulk phases and an adsorbing surface which is a boundary. Contemporary geomechanics utilizes these concepts quite a lot. Carbon dioxide sequestration, I think we talked about energy geotechnics, clear? So the issue is unless you master these concepts, contemporary geomechanics cannot be studied. Hope you are realizing this point. So if I am flushing out let us say methane from the coal beds, I cannot do flushing with water. So what I will have to do is I will have to inject carbon dioxide which will flush out the methane and I can collect this methane somewhere and I can use it for cooking purpose. And what I am gaining is this carbon dioxide which I have captured from the environment is being inserted into the ground, sequestration is done. So it is very advantageous things. Now there are some guys who are against this, why? Now they are saying if there is no carbon dioxide in the environment, what will happen to the vegetations? So this is a new theory which is coming up nowadays, so you have to counter it. They say you know plants require carbon dioxide for their survival. So this is a very latest news item which was there. I was reading this and it is a very valid point. But the issue is you are not going to catch the entire carbon dioxide which is present in the atmosphere. So let us talk about the recharge capacities of the aquifers and their saturation capacities. In your hydraulic courses you must have talked about the you know discharge capacity of the wells. How much a well can discharge fluid? The same thing we are doing here in the opposite way. We are inserting gases up to their saturation limits, fine. So a lot of concepts, you know, will evolve when you start doing the practice of these type of things. This is washing. So when the concentration or pressure of the substance in the bulk phase is lowered, some of the soft substance move to the bulk state. It is a simple process. I do not know whether you have seen people making juices of different fruits. What do they do? First they will crush the juice, so sorry, fruit. They will squeeze out all the juice, they will add some water. Why? This water has least concentration of any external agent. So when it interacts with the pulp of the fruits, as a leachate, whatever it will take out will also be having some part of the fruit juices. Next time when you are drinking sugarcane juice, go and stand in front of the machine and see how these guys keep on, you will recycle 
that particular uh, you know chain. Now comes the question uh, what are the characteristics of geomaterials which are uh, directly or indirectly influencing the sorption and desorption characteristics of geomaterials. So, the first thing is that uh, this is the best possible philosophy to define interaction between geomaterial and contaminant fine and this is what the main theme is in contemporary geomechanics. Most of the problems are interaction problem the way you have studied soil structure interaction in conventional geomechanics clear. So, you construct a foundation on the uh, uh, strata and then you say there is an interaction taking place between the soil and the foundation system and then you plot the pressure diagrams and so on. So, interaction problem piles is an interaction of the element pile element with the soil. So, again this is a soil structure interaction problem uh, returning earth walls is a beautiful example of soil structure interaction problem. So, in mechanics mostly interaction problem is very well studied, but for substance so, sorry for substances like geomaterial and contaminant this interaction is very intricate and not much studied. So, hence people are trying to study this in a very rigorous manner. So, if you want to define this interaction uh, which is going to be dictated by the sorption and desorption process which are antagonistic to each other you know uh, and as I said that these are the strategies which are used for remediation of the contaminant soils site cleanup program, uh, soil washing I think I talked about soil flushing which I talked about then vitrification I did not talk about. What is vitrification? I think I talked about this long long back when I was uh, talking about the disposal of atomic waste. So, vitri you must have come across this word vitrified tiles. What are vitrified tiles? You take the clay and fire it at very high temperatures vitrification what it does why very high temperature? So, a normal constituent of clay would be alumina, silica, calcium, iron, magnesium potassium, sodium and so on clear. So, when you are firing at very high temperature what is going to happen? These elements are going to melt fine. So, when they melt it becomes a homogeneous liquid sort of a thing. So, from a solid state of the mineral you have converted into a liquid phase and then you crystallize it to form a monolith system and that is a tile very high tensile strength even if the tile falls it won't break very good insulator for current as well as heat because of the porous structure very good tensile strength very good compressive strength also glazing and so on whatever you are designing so vitrification is a process where i can amalgamate the waste components at very high temperature with the soils or rocks themselves clear. So, once in this form nothing is going to leach out of the material are you getting this point this is what the vitrification process is homogenization of the materials at very high temperatures is vitrification. Another good example of vitrified fluid would be lava which is coming out of the volcanoes and when it settles and cools what happens? Igneous rocks are formed and igneous rocks are known to be of very high strength even though if they are vesiculous. So, this is a technique which is normally being used uh, in disposal and handling of toxic waste mostly atomic waste. So, what they do is they use plasma rods they can achieve 2000 degree centigrade and suppose if there is a whole area which is contaminated with radionuclides what I can do is by using the plasma rods I can vitrify the whole area. So, it becomes a monolith the contaminants become a part of the matrix of the soil and they get locked in them 
even if you keep them in water nothing is going to come out fine. In other words this is also known as classification of waste glass formation. Another technique is solidification by using let us say cement or any type of admixture which would form a matrix. I can solidify the contaminated phase present in the soils and the geomaterials in such a manner that nothing will again come out of the matrix. So, this is solidification mostly you have to use some cementitious material. So, either cement or any type of admixture or resins which you might have come across can be used for solidification. So, long back the practice was they used to use these canisters of the atomic material atomic waste and they used to put it in a concrete chamber and they used to cast the entire thing all over. So, this used to get solidified and vitrified in the matrix of concrete and that unit could be buried somewhere. Is this part clear? So, this is the whole trick behind uh, disposal of highly toxic waste or nuclear waste. Is this part clear? Any questions? Immobilization. So, immobilization is also a cousin brother of solidification. So, what you are doing is you are fixing the components which are leachable cations and you are fixing them on the surface of the substrates. So, immobilization is also done with the help of cementitious materials fine. So, these are the techniques uh, which are used nowadays in uh, remediation schemes for contaminated soils. Most of these techniques deal with this option desorption mechanisms. Sorption is a good process. I want to make sure that once the waste is in this form, how much of the waste is going to get sobbed on the surface. And suppose somebody asked me out of this matrix which you have vitrified or which you had solidified or which you had immobilized, how much contaminants will leach out over a period of time. So, ultimately you are going to bury it somewhere. So, that becomes a desorption process. So, uh Vitrification is it practically feasible everywhere like whenever you are dealing with the toxic waste this seems to be a good option. It will be like more costly also. Then. Cost is immaterial please remember the most of the projects which you do what is the cost of MTHL which is being done the bridge between Sivari and Navi Mumbai 19,000 crores. What is the cost of international project which is being done? 45,000 crores. What is the cost of the entire metro which is being done in Bombay city? See, see cost is okay, fine. Uh, as I, I think I told you long, long back. Professionals do not talk about the cost. Cost is meant for the guys who are dash, dash, dash. So, for professionals it is cost is nothing because you understand the reason for doing surgery. Do you never share with the doctor? Just take 50 percent today and I will give you 50 percent later on. Have you ever seen a surgeon who will say okay I will do 50 percent surgery today, 50 percent later on. So, these are all life saving procedures. Imagine if you are not taking care of the environment like this what for you are living then and what will be the implications. So, cost is the last thing forget about the cost at all clear ok. Any other question apart from the cost? Can I say that absorption is adsorption uh, is responsible for absorption. So, without without absorption. Yes. So, the first you are right. So, the first mechanism is something has to come in contact with the surface. So, the surface could be free surface all right. So, here there is no absorption or only sorption taking uh, adsorption taking place. But suppose in case of the porous media like foam, so first it has to go inside which is absorption A B and then followed by adsorption. Then the liquid phase from the surface is penetrating into the matrix perpendicular to the pores. 
even the absorption that happened in the fluid getting into the pores that is also because of absorption in the liquid. So, the process is so fast that you the material does not get any time to interact with the surface inside clear. So, the equilibrium is achieved. Now, what is going to happen? The fluid phase starts interacting with the walls and then penetrates through in. Then this becomes adsorption process clear. So, you are right the first thing is it has to absorb and then it has to adsorb, but suppose you are dealing with only surfaces and there is no pores then it is simple case of adsorption fine. So, let us not go into those entry cases, but I am sure even if you take the surface of a system and if you look into it you will find that there are a lot of pores on the surface also. So, there are something known as surface pores. I think I will show you when I talk about the MIT analysis. Is this okay? Yes, yes please. Sir, we talked about uh, chemisorption, what about physis option? Yeah, physis option is the surface. So, on the surface whatever is happening because of the physics of the material is physis option. Surface area is very high, clear? So, very high surface area any cation comes gets parked over there with this option, but subsequently what happens when T is not equal to 0 as time progresses what is going to happen? There is a mechanism taking place perpendicular to the plane of this surface and that is chemist option. You got the point? Another good example of this option would be cold welding. You must have seen these uh, vessels which are used for kitchen in the kitchen. So, there is a steel body and at the base what do they do? They fix a copper uh, you know a certain fraction of the bottom of the vessel would be a copper vessel. Why? Copper is a good conductor but expensive than steel. So, rather than making the whole vessel of copper what do they do? They do cold pressing. So, at very low temperature you bring two bodies together and press them. This is the cold welding adsorption process. Surface to surface contact under high pressure low temperatures fine. Glues when you glue when you when you fix two pages or two papers by putting a glue what 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 is happening? It's a it's a phase option or it's a chemist option. You must have noticed even if you put a drop of water and put another paper and tamp it like this, for a few minutes it gets stuck. Clear? Once the water gets dried up, again they will become, you know, two entities. But suppose if I add a little bit of glue in that, glue migrates into the pores of the paper. The way the trees are grown roots what what roots do they go and penetrate deep inside the pore systems of the soils. So, same thing is happening here also the glue drop goes into the pores forms a complete network and that gives lot of anchorage both sides on both the papers. So, then paper gets stuck completely. So, very interesting mechanism no. So, that is the chemist option at the pore level. Yeah, so vitrification means what you have done is you have created a matrix which is now a sort of immobilized due to high temperatures crystallization. It is expected that nothing will come out of it after vitrification because what you have done is at very high temperature you have homogenized the system. So, it is very difficult now for any heavy metal or a cation to move out from a fixed matrix into the outside world. So, it is a good solution, but as you said number one expensive, number two expertise, number three you are basically burning all the soil and re reducing the volume also, then you require some backfill material also there. So, these are the issues, but th this is how the engineering is done. Fine. Okay. Finding it interesting. So, these are the practical solutions which you have to give to your clients when they approach you.
I hope now it's clear to all of you what is the importance of sorption and desorption characteristics. First of all, fate and transport of reactive contaminants. Uh, when you want to study, the first step is talk about the sorption and desorption mechanisms because this tells you what will be the fate and how contaminant transport is going to occur from one point to another point in the geomaterials. If I want to establish the cleanup strategies efficiency, so you stabilize the soils first and then show that nothing is leaching out. So that means your immobilization, stabilization, your cleanup project which you have taken up is quite efficient and you have done a good job. This is a very important thing and I was telling you that every government, you know, every country spends a lot of money in selecting the right place for disposal of atomic waste. Actually the genesis of environmental geomechanics started from nuclear waste disposal. I hope you can relate this very easily. So the moment people started dealing with the nuclear waste, the obvious question was how to tackle with the waste which is getting generated. An obvious answer is either you send it into different galaxy orbits, that is what people did for a long time. They used to put all the atomic waste in rockets and they used to launch them into a different orbit. And whenever they used to explode there, it used to be a good rain of atomic waste. So then ultimately International Atomic Agency stopped this practice which many nations were following. There is no harm in sending 300 kg of atomic waste in the orbit. There were some guys who were sending it to Antarctica, there were few guys who were leaving it in the oceans, there were few guys who were disposing it in the ocean, there were few guys who were disposing it somewhere and somewhere and somewhere. So all this was going on until this international atomic energy came as a watchdog and they started following what is happening in different country and everybody has to follow them. If you do not follow them, what will happen? There will be another Afghanistan. Iraq, clear? So this is how the strategy started and to my knowledge environmental geomechanics started mostly to deal with the nuclear waste disposal, backfilling, finding out the best possible materials which can be used as the covers for disposal sites and site reconnaissance to find out the best possible site where the waste should be disposed. All right, I will show you what are the best possible sites. So selection of suitable geological formations where this type of waste should be disposed, all right. The site selection has to be done and for that you have to take out the materials, soils, rocks from that location, do different tests and see whether the sorption capacity is high or not. If sorption capacity is not high, it is a passive material, there is no point in dumping the waste over there because this option will be very easy because of the groundwater flow. You understand the implication? I think I am telling you in a very layman's language. Is it followable? You can follow it easily? Good. And then comes the backfill materials. What type of backfill materials should be utilized so that they have a tendency to keep the activity buried inside. Nothing should come out of it into the atmosphere as well as into the environment design of barrier layers for waste containment system. So when you are doing GCL design, CCL design, what type of clay should be utilized? And the simple answer is the absorption capacity should be very high. Accumulation of heavy metals and pesticides in subsoils. So if the soils are hyperactive, they will have a tendency to accumulate heavy metals. Is, is it good for health? or good for the plant health first of all? No, but there are few plants which are well known for accumulation of heavy metals and that is why doctors prescribe certain patients not to eat those vegetables. They say avoid these vegetables, you know. The answer is this because these plants have an affinity towards, we call them as the uptake capacity of plant. 
So, either through their roots or through their leaves, they have a tendency to catch these cations. So, these plants are normally used for decontamination of remediate or remediating the contaminated lands, which is known as phytoremediation. All right. So, many times people use plants for decontaminating soil, phytoremediation. Many times people use bioconcepts also along with it. So, this becomes biophytoremediation. There was a time when agricultural scientists used to talk about all these things, but now I think you can realize that everything is mechanics based and geotechnical engineers are the front runners in modeling all these type of things. Correct. So, we have spread our tentacles and most of the subjects and you know everything is now belonging to our domain. So, if you want to understand what is the accumulation capacity of heavy metals of the subsoils and where you are growing certain crop. So, you have to do these type of studies, take the samples and do the absorption desorption studies and try to see what is the affinity of this soil towards copper, mercury, lead, chromium, strontium and all these things. Because somebody might drop you know contaminant somewhere and it might so happen that all these contaminants get logged in the soil at one place and that may become very detrimental to you. Similarly, pesticides also. So, what are the challenges? Uh, the biggest problem is as you will understand slowly that sorption desorption characteristics are extremely difficult to determine. The reason is Apart from human errors, these parameters depend a lot on the environmental characteristics. Particularly, they are very sensitive to temperatures and pressures because I hope you must have realized by this time that this is the game between a surface and an atom or an ion which is going to interact with each other. So, this type of interaction is very susceptible to the characteristics of both clear and temperature and pressure conditions and that makes it extremely difficult for anybody to determine it. So, precise determination of sorption, I have used the term KD, distribution coefficient, partitioning coefficient, people call it and L, L corresponds to leaching or desorption. So, this is normally defined as KDL. So, this is a sorption coefficient, this is the desorption coefficient and uh, another challenge is very difficult to determine these terms quickly. So, when you are designing repositories where the waste has to be dumped, uh, you would like to get these parameters beforehand so that you can run your computer programs or one dimensional advection diffusion equation and you know what is going to go outside that control volume. C t by C naught should be some value outside this control volume. Is this part clear? Are you able to follow what I am saying? Yes, Arjun. Mm. So, I was thinking about like uh, when we are talking about the containment system like uh, waste containment system where various barriers are provided, we are thinking about the treating of that waste system. So now, we are, the we are dealing out? We, we, are, we talked about how the waste system can be treated. Treated, that yes. After barrier layers are provided. Correct. Now, the context change, uh, now we are talking about the barrier layers which have the capacity to absorb or absorb the waste system and the, the context changes uh, about we are dealing about the sorption characteristics. And Correct. So, you are right. So, you remember the plumes which I had shown and they are getting accumulated and then what we did we inserted a containment system clear. So, I had asked you a question whether this is a better choice or the one when the water table is moving. Some of you had answered that the first situation is better where you are accumulating everything in your own premises. So, yes, there are constraints. You cannot allow these contaminants to go in somebody else's courtyard. How to clean up your system? Clear? So, this is where you have to do desorption of the soils. Clear? The, the containment which you have created should be good absorbing agents. So, you want to create a situation where most of the contaminants which are present in the soil will get sorbed onto these matrix which you have inserted into the ground, fine. So, there are different contexts or 
ways of looking at the problem, the way you want to solve it. Yes, you are right. And extent of the problem. Extent means depth, time, cost, ease and so on. So, suppose the percolation of contaminant is up to 50 meters. So, even if you grow a plant, nothing is going to happen up to 50 meters. Then what you have to do? You have to contain it all around. Then you have to spend a lot of money. Now, these are the challenges which people like her are trying to study, is it not? Mining issues, environmental issues in mining and what not. If you want to go 250 meter deep in the mines, what type of measure should be taken so that geo environment does not get contaminated, fine. Or you are disposing something at a depth of 100, say 800 meter deep nuclear waste. So, the chances are if the water table flows, it may spread, it may come on the surface also, it may go deep inside also, it may contaminate the entire area. How would you stop these type of things? Is this okay? Good. Any other question? Implications are tremendous, concepts are simple. Applying these concepts in real life is an art. I hope you realize that the, I can create any situation, but if you ask me for an answer, I have to think and I have to design things for that matter. Yes. Adding to what uh, Arjun said, uh, I read a paper where uh, they were using an expansive soil, RBT, red bull tallow for waste containment systems only. So they were uh, like uh, checking the reduction in hydraulic conductivity and you said like the absorption and desorption characteristics changes with temperature and pressure. So they had to check for desiccation uh, cracking also. This is this was because of the temperature and pressure thing. So they were trying to see uh, which which type of soil should be used so that it can uh, like reduce the desiccation characteristics also. Very good. So in conventional geomechanics, you have always heard that you know swelling shrinking type of soils are a curse. But for environmental geotechnologies, these materials are the boom. Now you get the answer to this question. In conventional geomechanics, everybody has said, get rid of this soil, fill them with the best possible material. Here it is reverse. These are the materials which have more affinity, more activity, more surface area, more cation exchange capacity and so on. So I want to utilize them, clear? That is why you always fill bentonite when you dispose the atomic waste or toxic waste. Yes, you are right. So, this is one challenge and second challenge is these experiments are extremely expensive, very expensive experiments. Even in the laboratory when you do, uh, they are very time consuming, extremely uh, you know precise measurements have to be done because you are dealing with the uh, molecular level and atomic level. So, let me explain to you a bit of uh, the KD parameter. I think I have already talked about what is KD. The philosophy is if contaminant is migrating through a porous system and in case partitioning occurs, that means certain fraction of the contaminant from the liquid phase, they get detached from the liquid phase and get sobbed onto the minerals or the walls of the pores. Clear? So, there is a loss of concentration in the fluid. Clear? This is sort of a partitioning effect, so part, part, sort of a distribution effect. This is what is KD. So, this is also known as partitioning or distribution coefficient, is a measure of sorption of contaminants in soils, rocks, and mixtures. And uh, we use two terms CS and CW. CS is the concentration of the sorbate <coughs> which is sorbed per unit mass of the solids. Solids are substrates, agree, on which these contaminants will get plugged to the amount of sorbate remaining in the solution, concentration which is remaining in the solution. So, whatever is getting sorbed on the solid phase and whatever remains on the liquid phase, if you plot a relationship between the two, you get distribution coefficient. So, these are the things on which the KD measurements will uh, depend, experimental conditions. 
measurement methodology and many times the contaminant characteristics and the characteristics of the surface substrate on which uh, the whole process is going to take place. First thing is soil itself is so heterogeneous that you cannot quantify the surface properly. There is always a degree of uncertainty, clear? Even if the chemical characteristics remain constant, but within the chemical characteristics also there is a decay component, there is an activity component, there is a concentration drop component, there is a pH change component, there is a precipitation effects going on, clear? You know, so many things. Viscosity might change because of the temperature alteration, density might change because of the temperature alteration and so on. Flash points in case of the fluids which are vaporizing, which are having a flash point, which are organic materials. So, this becomes a very complicated thing. To quantify this whole thing, uh, there are two types of systems which normally we study. One is solid water interface, all right, because most of the contaminants are in the liquid phase. And from this liquid phase, the contaminants are getting sorbed onto the soil particles. So, this is solid water. The relationship is C s upon C w, concentration of contaminant in the solid phase, concentration of contaminants in the liquid phase. The ratio of the two is known as K d parameter, fine. The second one is very complicated, water and vapor. Any gaseous phase when it is interacting with the water. So, like now what we are doing is when we talk about the gas hydrates and uh, couple <laughs> phenomena, <laughs> life becomes miserable practically. I hope now you can understand what is going to happen. Here the contaminants in the water phase or the liquid phase are getting solved on the solids. Now, what is happening? The vapor phase of the contaminants is getting solved on the water and the solids also, clear? So, this is a slightly complicated mechanics. This is defined as, what, how would you define this now? This was the concentration of solids, sorry, concentration of the contaminants on the solids. This is the concentration of the gases, all right, divided by concentration of contaminants in the liquid phase. Have you come across this Henry's law in your chemistry courses? So, this is what actually you have to take care of. <laughs> you have to learn lot of interdisciplinary things to deal with these situations. This is the equation which is normally used. This is the total concentration present in the geomaterials, rho b is the density multiplied by C s is the concentration of contaminants in the solid phase, theta w is the volumetric moisture content multiplied by C w is the amount of concentration present in the liquid phase, theta g is the volumetric vapor content. How do you obtain vapor content in volume form? Like suppose if you have to find out the what is the volumetric vapor content present in the pores. This is a big question when you deal with the multiphase geomechanics, fine. So, it is very difficult to measure it, but it is very easy to compute it, back compute it. So, theta is the porosity and uh, if you know the porosity, it so happens when you put theta g equal to 0, this becomes a saturated material, clear? So, theta w is nothing but the porosity into saturation. Volumetric water content is equal to porosity into saturation, clear? So, if saturation is 1, uh, volumetric water content would be equal to porosity. So, it is an interesting way to check the porosity of the geomaterials. You saturate them and then measure their volumetric moisture content by using a TDR probe or by using FDR probe. 
software. So, you get the porosity directly. Right now, we are dealing with the multi-phase geomechanics and multi-phase geomechanics involves all these things. Initially, it appears to be difficult, but slowly and slowly it becomes a part of your life. This is easy to follow, determination of sorption and desorption characteristics of geomaterials. There are two types of tests which are normally done. One is the batch test, another one is the column test. So, in batch test what they normally do is they will take <coughs> certain volume of a liquid and in that they will drop certain amount of solids. Let us say 100 ml of water mixed with contaminants and 5 grams of soils clear and then you shake it well and keep on measuring the concentration of the contaminants in the solution. So, whatever drop in concentration is taking place, this concentration is getting sobbed onto the solids. Very good. So, you have understood everything. Fine, it is a simple thing. So, this way I got CS value. If initial concentration is known and CS I have computed, I know CW that is the concentration which is remaining in the fluid phase. So, the ratio of the two is nothing but your KD parameter. Clear? Unfortunately, in nature, this type of situation never occurs. You do not have soil in the powder form, clear? Because most of the soils are deposited soils. So, what it indicates is though we are performing batch tests for our convenience, truly speaking, batch tests have no relevance in real life unless you are doing some industrial process. Is this correct? So, batch tests always gives you a extremely high value of the KD parameter because this is a situation which you are creating where all the surfaces which are free to sorb contaminants are accessible to the contaminants which is not going to happen in a compacted soil mass because when you are compacting the soil most of the surface gets hidden because of another particle. Agreed? So, fully realizing this fact, people have switched over to column tests, which is a replica of what happens in nature, because in nature soils are in the deposit form. So, what is done is either you take the soil, reconstitute a column or you cut a core and fix it in the column and then do a simple falling head test or a constant head test with chemicals in the percolate and then try to see what concentration is coming out. That is it. Very good. So, you followed it. Yes. Sir, how are we going to measure CS? So, suppose if I take some solution and I have added some soil into it and I will shake it for some time, I will have to keep on sampling the solution every now and then and take that solution and do ICP analysis or atomic absorption spectroscopy and from there I get the, the concentration which is present in the solution at that moment, clear? So, initial concentration is known. Now, whatever is available is Cw. So, C minus Cw becomes your Cs. That is how you do it. Cs is a concentration that is absorbed. Like that is sorbed on the material. On the grains of yes. the soils, correct. So, but the this concentration may increase when See, when it is yes, so I will show you the graph. So, right now you just understand the concept when I show you the results then you can follow it better. So, what is happening is you have to keep on taking the sample and keep on measuring the concentration. What will happen is the concentration from the liquid phase is going to decrease because this is going to get deposited on the solids. So, there will be a decrease in concentration of the liquids. Initial concentration minus this is Cs which is the concentration which is getting sobbed onto the solid particles and that will be increasing, clear? So, this is how you can interpret the two results. Your column test also we do the same thing, pour the liquid of certain concentration and let it exit from the other end, measure the concentration there, whatever gets retained is CS, whatever comes out is in the liquid form, clear? Good. So, column tests basically correspond to the real life situation. 
Now, batch tests, as I said, they are not a real similitude between geometrical contaminant immobilization agent interaction. This was an interesting philosophy on which one of my PhD scholars, Dr. Naidu, worked. He is at IIT Chennai now. So, this was his PhD thesis. Most of these research topics were philosophical, you know. What happens when contaminants interact with soils, geomaterials, immobilizing agents, interaction mechanisms which are trying to develop. Now, the relationship between CW and CS is known as isotherm. It has nothing to do with the temperature, but the name is epizonomer. We call this as CS versus CW relationship as isotherm. I will show you these graphs, so you need not to write, just follow it. Column tests on the contrary are very time consuming and very cost intensive and the problem is because of the low hydraulic conductivity, they take too much of time. So, this is where we did centrifuge modeling to show that these processes can be accelerated. This was the first attempt ever made to show how sorption desorption characteristics can be accelerated in a centrifuge, geotechnical centrifuge. The reason is very simple, geotechnical engineers never worked on these areas. And the guys who were working on these areas were not aware of geotechnical centrifuge modeling. So, this is what happened, clear? So, when we started working on these type of concepts, we amalgamated the two, two thoughts and then we came out with some interesting ideas. So, I will show you some interesting solutions. It so happens that whatever is going to happen in the field is quite close to the column test, fine? But again, because of the size of the sample, sample size is very small, heterogeneity effects are there, then people say there could be a preferential flow between the sample and the inner walls of the container, whatever problems you have in the hydraulic conductivity measurement, fine. So, both the tests are having their own limitations and strengths, but then as an engineer you have to rely on something. So, better solution would be you get the results from batch tests and column tests and somewhere you compromise and then select the parameters. So, this is what normally people do. There is one method also known as uh, determination of uh, sorption characteristics by using organic matter. So, if organic matter is present in the soils, the sorption capacity increases because organic matter has a tendency to hold contaminants because their cation exchange capacity could be higher, though they are not particulate systems. So, this is in short the whole process is about either you conduct batch test, column test or if you know the organic matter of the soil, you can compute its sorption characteristics. Uh, do not write this, but just for your information, ASTM has some guidelines on doing sorption desorption experiments. Then there is a Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, we call it as OCED and this is responsible for trade between two nations. You will be surprised to know most of the things which you import and export are bound to be tested for their sorption desorption capacities and hence it has a direct linkage with the economics of the entire process. This is where environmental geomechanics is playing an important role in dealing with the economy of the country. I hope you understand because most of the trade businesses are related to the material activities. So, these are the factors which influence overall characteristics of the materials and hence they also influence the sorption and desorption properties. So, the first thing is type of the soil specific surface area, very high specific surface area KD parameter will be more, pozonic activities. You remember you were talking about you know immobilization, solidification of the contaminants. So, when you are immobilizing them, I told you that you use normally some cementitious material or admixtures. So, this is where the pozolonic activity of the material becomes very, very important. How much it is going to react with the lime? We also call it as lime reactivity. 
cation exchange capacity which is related to specific surface area. Liquid to solid ratio, how much you know uh, solution you are taking and how much soil you are adding to this because these parameters are very sensitive to the amount of solids taken and the concentration of a contaminant in the solution form. It is not a mathematics that you say liquid to solid ratio is this. If your soil content changes, I hope you can understand at microscopic level the total surface which was available for sorption process to occur will get altered. So, it is not mathematics that you say liquid to solid ratio is this clear I can create L to S ratio by adjusting the numbers, but I cannot adjust the sites on the surface of the particles which are ready to sorb contaminants. Now, these manipulations are done by the industrialists who make good sorbents. You understand? So, dehumidifiers. So, the type of dehumidifiers or the silica you know tablets which you keep in your electronic gadgets. So, they are designed accordingly that how much moisture could be and all these elements will have a tendency to take up the moisture. So, if you want to accelerate this whole surface area which is related to moisture holding capacity also these are the constraints fine. Then pH of the soil solution because pH guides the precipitation process of the salts. Buffer capacity of the sorbent. I hope you remember what is buffering you must have done in your 10 plus 2 physics or oh sorry chemistry. So, buffering is how easily a system can maintain its pH value. So, in most of the interaction problems it so happens if you are dealing with very high pH values and suppose contaminant is having very low pH value. So, there is going to be an equilibration of very high pH to very low pH, but the material which can maintain its own pH is supposed to be the best material for your applications. That means, it shows you the best possible buffering capacity. It maintains its pH despite getting attacked by pH lower or pH very high. So, this is the fundamental property of the minerals. There are minerals who have very good buffering capacity and that is the reason it is no surprise that most of the medicines have minerals in them which you consume fine. So, what do they do? They maintain the pH of your body. This is part clear. Temperature grain size, the smaller the grain size, very high surface area, very high cation exchange capacity, good sorbent, very high KD value. Clays are good sorbing material as compared to sands. A fine fraction of a material is going to be more reactive as compared to its coarse fraction. So, even if I take sands, I hope now you can relate, Jasmine. Aluminosilicates which are being used for treating AMD, why they are so active? Maybe their surface area is extremely high or maybe their buffering capacity is very high, clear? So, these are the reasons why when they get attacked by the AMD, they buffer and they make things neutral. So, these are naturally available. Presence of other ions. Now, what happens is in the presence of other ions, there would be a selective sorption. I think I told this concept long back and that selective sorption would depend upon the size of the cations and their valency. So, higher valence cation would get preference or for getting sorbed onto the surface because of higher affinity. But suppose it is very bulky, it is sluggish, it cannot run so fast, what is going to happen? The smaller one will beat it and then it will go and get fixed on the surface, <laughs> clear? So, this is becoming a selective sorption. So, these type of studies normally people do because the industrial sludges will not have only one species of contaminants. They will have several species of contaminants, clear? So, there is going to be a competitive sorption within several species of contaminants which are present in the sludge. 
and then you have to be selective. So, suppose if somebody asks me a question that I am going to give you a sludge and you remove only one particular type of a cation, clear? So, this happens to be a selective sorption process and later on what I will do? I have collected them and I will collect them. So, this becomes a natural resource. Are you getting this point? So, you are harnessing something out of a process which might be useful for you. Ionic strength, organic content and ferrous and manganese oxides. They have peculiar characteristics, you know, oxidation reduction we call them both and then carbonate content. So, these are, this is a very big list. I have not included most of the parameters over here, but I hope you can realize that it is becoming very difficult for people to control all these parameters under laboratory environment. So, those of you who are very eager to learn what are the uncertainties in doing these tests, please go through the papers which are written by Pankaj Patak. So, this is the most contemporary uh, R&D work which was done internationally. Dr. Pankaj Patak. So, she is the one who has uh, spent lot of time doing this option desorption characteristics of different types of geomaterials and various cationic species, fine. Is this okay? Any questions? So, I will just quickly run through now the experimental procedure and the analysis of the results so that all of you can follow better and to answer your point uh, what you were asking for. So, normally what is done is you take geometry in the powder form, put it in a contaminant in solution form and <coughs> do continuous stirring so that more and more interaction occurs. Normally the procedure is you create different liquid to solid ratios. Uh, you take certain amount of liquid say 100 ml and uh, S if you are doing L by S equal to 10, so 100 ml liquid 10 grams of soils. L by S is 20, so half of that clear and so on. And then you keep on checking the interaction time. Now, what happens is this is how the results are plotted. Now, C E, let us start with the T time. Now, this is the equilibration time. This is the liquid to solid ratio, different experiments which you are doing. C I is the initial concentration. C E is the concentration of the contaminants in the solution which is present. This can be measured, Neeraj. So, you are doing this experiment, keep on taking the doses, check them on ICP, atomic absorption spectrometer. So, CE is known, CI minus CE will give you CS and multiplied by liquid to solid. So, basically we get CS and once we get CS, we know the CE value which is nothing but CW and you can complete the isotherm, I will show you subsequently. A little bit of interpretation of these results. What you are observing is when the interaction starts because of the activity of the soil, the concentration of contaminants in the liquid phase decreases with respect to time and this becomes constant. Now, this is what is known as equilibration time for different contaminants and different geomaterials, the equilibration time would be different under different experimental conditions, fine. Is this part clear? Did you get the answer to your question? Is this okay? In column tests, whatever effluents are coming out, you measure them. Initial concentration minus this is sobbed. Whatever is coming out is in the liquid phase. Again, you can complete the isotherms. Yes. So, in batch testing, like we put the powder form of uh, soil in the solution. So, it will obviously get dispersed. So, while we are taking the sample for measuring of water for measuring the concentration, how will we make sure that uh, soils are not coming into that? Very solids? good. So, 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 there are two terms which I have used either out of your innocence, disperse or you are really highly clear about why you are using these terms. So, first of all, dispersive soils very difficult to do sorption desorption studies the soils which really disperse because they form a cloud. Now, what you have to do is then there are different techniques of sample preparation and you have to spend enough time 
doing settling of these particles which remains in the cloud form. I hope you understand what are dispersive soils. Dispersive soils are the soils which have so much of electromagnetic forces in between them that they form a cloud, clear, fine. All swelling type of soils will have dispersive nature. So what you have to do is take them in cuvettes and do ultra centrifugation for hours at 1 lakh rpm, 2 lakh rpm and so on. So in the process what happens is the fluid phase gets segregated from the dispersed grains, they are not grains truly speaking, they are colloids and then you can separate them out, very difficult process, <coughs> fine. So if you have used this word dispersed out of any of these two options, you can correct it now. So, so okay, let me now complete the answer. So what you can do is you can filter it by using different type of filter papers which are available in the market, not the one which you use normally. So the filter paper might like. Yeah, so that's what I am going to tell you. These filter papers are highly specialized filter papers and they are extremely expensive. They are sub-molecular size filter papers also which are known as Watsman paper. So next time when you go to the lab, take out a piece, they might be, each paper might be 600 rupees, 1000 rupees and something like that. So these are the filter papers which are normally used for separating blood serum and all those things. In dialysis normally they use it, which is used for doing these tests also, where the finest fraction of the colloid can be separated from the liquid phase. So this becomes highly complicated. So now the simple answer to your question would be, if your soils are dispersive, whether to rely on batch test or not is a big question mark, that is it, devise some other method. Also like you told us if organic matter is more in the soil, Correct. so it will have more sorption value. Correct. But that will be a temporary solution, that, that is not good, uh, it will have sorption value but it will decompose and then this will be desorbed after some time. True, that is right. So it is not a good thing like having organic content. I do not know how to deal with the situation. So you have to create a problem first and then work on it to get a solution out of it, clear? But yes, this is an issue, you are right. So is this part clear, simple experiment, batch test? These are the isotherms. So that means when you plot CE and CS or in other words CS and CW, try to draw linear relationship, this becomes a linear isotherm. So this is the concentration of contaminant on the grains concentration of the contaminant in the liquid form. This is the Langemuir isotherm, this is the form of the isotherm, this is the friendlish isotherm of different coefficients and then you plot always CS with respect to CE. CE is in water concentration of contaminant and CS is the concentration of contaminant in the solids, fine. The slope of this line is going to give you KD parameter, okay, along with other sorption isotherms. Once the sorption process is over, you start washing it and then you get desorption isotherm. So except for the fact that all these coefficients are subscripted with L, so this will become CSL, CEL. That means concentration of solids which is remaining during washing on the solids. CEL will be concentration of contaminant which is coming out in the solution phase because of washing. If I plot these two, I get KDL, fine, simple. Worthiness of the materials for their environmental applications is established by doing sorption characteristics. The whole idea is <clears throat> if I dispose a material which is toxic, and if I encapsulate in these type of materials which are highly sorbing, they will not let anything go out of it, very good situation. So you have designed the best possible barriers. As far as concentration is concerned only, is this part clear? Sir, are these remediation measures a way of locking the contaminants inside the soil mass? Yes, you are using the word locking. Locking. Uh, 
Yes, answer is yes, but whether it is a permanent locking or whether this is a temporary locking he was talking about is a big question. So, that means the leaching may occur within few hours, it may occur after few years, it may occur after few hundreds of years. But uh, then after, after these things, this oil can it be used in the same way as in the original like the strength may be different, obviously it may not be used oh, for the so please, please do not bring strength and all this right now in the picture at all. These are all micro mechanisms which we are talking about. So, then things will become really complicated like <coughs> people are now trying to work on all these things. So, this is just like your liquid limit, atabug limit characterization of the material in environmental geomechanics. The environmental geomechanics starts from this point onwards. You take a material, bring it to the lab, do this test first, clear and then establish the potential of the material how it should be used, clear? And then the answer is whether it can take so much of a strength under these type of thermal loading, chemical loading, electrical loading and so on. So, the so subject starts from this point onwards. Is this part okay? So, will the land be left barren after? Land will become barren, yes your question is correct, uh, its nutrients get washed out because of let us say flooding of the of the ground, if you create a, if you create a dam, water dam, I think I told you and we discussed in the class that because of this what happens, the water, the, the fields get waterlogged and because of water logging, all the nutrients get washed out and they become barren, yes you are right. So, if you want to model this whole thing, you can do it by using desorption characteristics of the soils. How easily the soils will get rid of their nutrients and you can speculate the whole thing and you can avoid a situation which might occur of this type in nature in near future. That is what the engineering is. Got the point or you are confused? Yes. In Swapson characteristics between solid and vapor. Say it again. Uh, in Swapson characteristics between that uh, solid and vapor phase, can we calculate the uh, vapor pressure by partial pressure that you are in? Yes. So, what they do is normally they expose soils to under vapor phases and then they again compute the same thing. What concentration of vapors get sorbed onto the solids? Sequestration process indirectly and then they compute again the CS value, the concentration of the vapor phase on the solids and whatever remains in the gaseous phase, difficult exercise to do at this moment. You require extremely precise balances to measure the amount of gaseous phase which is getting sorbed onto the solids or number 2 method would be use your concepts of chemistry, how many moles get sorbed onto the surface of a particle present in the gaseous phase. I am still learning all these things, so I cannot answer your question much better. These are the things which we have started recently in our lab. You have to give me some time to master it. Ganraj is doing this type of experiments, he is purging different type of gases in red mud and trying to neutralize it and then we are trying to bank compute how much sorption capacity will God knows what, okay. Okay. So, as I said the desorption characteristics is also similar, uh, you can compute and uh, you can again use the linear isotherm, Langmuir isotherm, Friendlich isotherm. Uh, this just to quickly tell you what this process is, I have already stepped over 5 minutes. So, when you take a contaminated material, this is what you are talking about, how quickly the material may lose its nutrients or can chemical concentration, nutrients also a concentration of chemicals is it not, though they are good chemical concentrations. So, the moment you put them in water phase, washing phase, slowly and slowly they lease out the concentration leaching and then ultimately it becomes constant. So, this is the equilibration time for leaching, desorption. It is faster, if you remember in the previous slide it was 24 hours, now this is 2 hours. So, 
accumulation of anything takes time, but losing that thing is very fast in life, it is valid every, in every aspect of life, including wealth accumulation. So, leaching of money is also very fast as compared to absorption of money. <laughs> well, these are few relationships just to demonstrate to you how things work out ultimately. So, you I hope you will notice that uh, L by S as I was saying is not a mathematical term. So, L by S has a strong relationship with KD parameter and that is what is more troubling to all of us. Quartz and Montmorenite mixture will have extremely high KD value, extremely high cation exchange capacity. Why? Because of Montmorenite. Quartz and orthoclase which is a passive material will have very small cation exchange capacity and low KD values, clear. So, most of the pitcher pots which you make, potteries, they are of inert soils. You do not want very reactive material there, because if it is very reactive what is going to happen? It is not good both ways. It will take all the best possible minerals from the soil and it will be solved on and what you will be drinking is distilled water every day, which is not good for health. Are you realizing the consequences? That is why they say that do not drink water keeping in plastic bottles. Why? Uptake capacity. Sometime back I used this word for the plants, that plants have uptake capacity. Now I am using this term for plastic bottles. So, plastic bottles also have uptake capacity. So, they accumulate things and whatever is left behind is and they may leach also chlorides. So, both ways detrimental and that is the reason if you leave the water in plastic bottle and drink it after some time, you realize the taste is different. Okay. So, some important relationships are KD might increase with time. Now, this is the kinetics process which uh, some of you are interested in you know how over a period of time the material changes its properties. Then KD changes with pH also, do not go by the characteristics of these graphs because they may change depending upon the type of uh, system which you are talking about, clear. But I just wanted to show you that these are very sensitive parameters. Uh, this is where actually we had uh, utilized the concept of thermal sorry electrical flux and chemical flux together to devise a new method. If you are interested, you can <coughs> read Dr. Dali Naidu's thesis and where what we have done is we have correlated the electrical conductivity with liquid solid ratio. Our idea was that leaching process and sorption can be studied with the help of electrical conductivity. So, during leaching the concentration in the solution phase is going to increase and during Sorption, the concentration of ions in the liquid phase is going to decrease. So, based on this, we wanted to develop some sensors, and we had developed this, and this concept was used quite well in uh, doing some column studies. Uh, you know, you just do a simple <coughs> hydraulic conductivity test in a centrifuge uh, where the sample is kept here, you pour the solution which is contaminated and uh, you get a BTC like this. This term I have defined is as the pore volumes. So, pore volume is an indication of how much volume of the solution is required to saturate all the pores of the sample. So, it is very easy to follow. This is the volume of the uh, solute which is passing through the sample and divided by this is the volume of the sample multiplied by porosity clear. So, porosity is V V upon capital V. So, this is the volume of the sample. So, this becomes number of volumes. So, volume of the solution divided by volume of the <coughs> pores that becomes a PV term. So, whenever you get a chance to work on this type of topics, this PV becomes a, a standard term how many volumes of the solution is required to complete the test. So, unless all the pores get filled up, you cannot conduct column tests, fine. So, if you conduct this test in a centrifuge, whatever percolant is coming out, I am measuring the concentration with respect to T, initial concentration is known. 
you can observe as time increases the C T by C naught value increases. At this point in the centrifuge, we started washing the sample. We poured fresh water in a spinning centrifuge and then you could get the washing curves just like you know these ideas came to see every day when you see the washing machines and all a lot of ideas come to your mind. Can we not wash soil sample inside a washing machine and if you wash the sample then what is going to happen? It is a sort of a leaching process. So, she was talking about leaching I think someone else was also talking about leaching when you bury the waste what is going to happen, how would you design the barriers and so on. So, by doing this simple test I hope you are realizing lot of mechanisms are getting evolved. You know this is nothing but the mechanism, how parking of contaminant occurs on the soils first sorption and then how easily they get desorbed. So, once you have completed your BTC you can use ADE alright. This is the retardation coefficient if you remember uh, where the KD is known you can get the R factor. R factor is an indicative of a soil contaminant system fine. So, now people are trying to work on different types of soil contaminants to make a lookup table. So, lookup table is if this is the contaminant, this is the soil, this is the KD value use this in your design that is it. If you can do this, it will be a great help to the profession. Then we did some centrifuge modeling to show how much time it takes uh, for sorption and desorption to occur. This was the modeling of models for sorption desorption mechanism. There is a school of thought which seriously thinks that whatever we have done is incorrect, which happens in international community, do not worry, worry about it. So, these papers are reviewed by 11 reviewers, 11, 12 reviewers in ASTM particularly. Ultimately, they had to publish these papers and uh, because their hunch was that sorption desorption mechanisms are at the molecular level and centrifuge modeling cannot be done at molecular level. So, we gave a very strong logic, you read these papers that why centrifuge modeling should be done at molecular level also, fine. So, this is how you have to advocate your case and what we have shown is that uh, I hope you learn, you have learned this modeling of models for the time and other things, sorption desorption time or the seepage time or the diffusion time or the, so your term of 2, 1, you know how do they come, they come like this. So, what we have shown is that the modeling of models for the sorption process is 1, however, for desorption it is under root term, 0.5 term, clear. So, that means desorption is going to be faster than sorption. So, all this type of scientific manipulations can be done uh, to show a case. I hope this gives you some idea about what type of studies have been done uh, to quantify the geomaterials. Could you follow something about? all this is good enough. Frankly speaking, I took lot of time to understand these things. <laughs> they are so complicated and uh, very intricate things, uh, you know you have to spend lot of time on this. But then I have made this module uh, where I convey this message to the undergraduates like you or my postgraduates like you. Uh, to just sort of an exposure that is what is happening. But if you have realized the concept, you can utilize them wherever you want, fine.